So first of all, while I was preparing for this, um, I, I listened to Digging a Hole, you know, kind of get back into the groove with the at, right. at first classic and man, it still holds up the test of time. Uh, it's a good recording. It's a really good recording. It was innovative for the time and it's, uh, yeah, no, it still really holds up. Do you think that you've ever gotten out of the hole? <laughs> I, I'm still, I'm still digging my way out. It seems. It's been a long journey. I mean, that that was a long time ago. Uh, but I, I want to no. go back in time a little bit, uh, even before all that. Back when you were a kid, you talked about how uh, Rush was the first concert you have ever been to. Your dad took you. You have yeah. a way cooler dad than I have. My dad would not take me to a Rush concert. Um, when you were flipping through his album collection when you were a kid, uh, was it Rush or maybe some other band that kind of awakened this love of music? No, my dad was Dean Martin, Neil Sedaka, Perry Como, that kind of stuff. They, my parents, they had no idea what was happening with with music, or especially at that time, they were. My dad was like a 1950s guy in the 1970s, <laughs> you know. Uh, but me and all my friends, you know, all they they all had immigrant parents who didn't speak English and all of a sudden there's these kids who want to go to a rock concert or a rock concert. What, what, what is that even? There's long hair and hippies and Oh no, no, no. So the parents shut that down. All of them shut it down. And we were just, we were like seventh graders, you know, and uh, it was pretty traumatic for us because we really wanted to go. And I'd been begging to go to concerts for years. I wanted to go see, Bob Dylan's Rolling Thunder. I wanted to go see Zeppelin. I wanted to see Kiss. I wanted to see the Stones. And finally, when Rush came, I just put my foot down. I was like, "I'm going. I don't. I don't care. I'll. I'm going." So we uh, we went across the river to Detroit and waited in line and got tickets. And then the parents said, "No, no, 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 no. You're not going." My dad finally was like the, the the peace negotiator he got with the other dads and said oh god damn it all right I'll, what if i take them <laughs> <laughs> so we, he didn't even have a ticket you know in those days it was a big arena concert show it, it's all kids running in to see a rock show i'm sure my dad who looked like a, an air force guy just you know walked up and was like oh no i'm i'm, I'm taking the boys and they just let him they just let him in. <laughs> what? They just let him in. What? <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, it's a different time. Yeah, definitely. Actually, and I was going to ask as a, a subsequent question: Do you actually own a kimono? <laughs> <laughs> a kimono? Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, I was thinking of doing a little rush tribute video, so I've had to go through my wife's closet looking for a kimono. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see if that comes to fruition. I don't know. Uh, let's go back to the, let's go come back to the present. So uh, you've got a new album, Eternity Now. Uh, yeah. Before we kind of dig deeper into that, what to you, uh, how, what things do you feel are eternal? It's a coffee question. Yeah, that is a coffee question. I haven't got to the bottom of that one yet. The coffee or the question. Um, you know that the the meaning behind the song is more just walking uh, the ability and willingness to let go of stuff and walk away from it and leave it to eternity. You know, etern leave it to the eternal past and walk towards an eternal future. That, that's leaving people and, and things behind and just making your peace with that. That's more what the song's about. That kind of goes along with how you describe the process of, of redoing this album. You mm -hmm. mentioned it's kind of cathartic. Um, it's also yeah, a it's been you know, pretty horrible uh, couple of years, you know, just between people bailing on us, 
people betraying us, people getting sick and dying, people getting sick and getting well, just, you know, life took over the recording process. And it puts things in perspective, you know, it's, it's just a rock and roll record. We'll be fine. You know, the, re the record will, will eventually come out. Uh, I just had to really put it into a different, you know, for so many decades, it was just everyone focused on the record, the tour, the show, the record, the tour, the show, the video, the promotion, go, go, go. Everything else took a back seat to that. But then, you know, when someone in your family gets cancer, you know, and, uh, oh, there's a, a number of things that happened in our lives that made lives that made us go, okay, how really, really, how important is that compared to what's happening right now in the moment? And so we reassessed everything. And it's a, it's an, an amazing mental freedom one gets when you let a bunch of things go. You know, all of a sudden the creative flow was a lot easier to get into. The yeah. album kind of wrote itself after that, where it was just, oh, I, I suddenly have thought about a lot of things. Let's, let's no, put it's, it a, it's a big lesson. In, in business, there's something called sunken costs, where you've invested in a project so much that you don't want to let it go because you say, I invested so much time and money. But pressing the leap, that, that moment in your head when you press the leap, what did it trigger? What was the, that feeling you got right after you said, okay, no, it's done. We're starting fresh. Yeah, for, uh, it was real freedom. Yeah, it was real creative freedom. Because, I, you know, there there have been some calamitous events throughout our whole career. And I've always fallen back on the notion that, okay, well, let's say there's a publishing dispute. Or there's some dispute over, you know, the like royalties, something that ties up a song. You can't use it anymore. Uh, I'm quite content with the knowledge that I can do this. They can't. I can, I can just make another one. I can make another song. I can make more music. I can play the guitar solo again. Working in the studio for as long as I have, it helps to get comfortable with the idea of sometimes you lose the best take. Your best take is not the band's best take. Sometimes there's an issue with the data, with the tape, with the machines, with something. Something happens and a performance is lost. And some people never get over that. It's like, well, but that was the that was the take. That was the best one. That was the take that was gonna make history. If you're any good, if you're any good every time you plug your guitar in should be history, right? Like yeah. if you allow that flow to happen and not get so hung up on what you just did, just let it go. Something else great will, will channel through you if you're, if you're relaxed and open to it. Yeah, I, I definitely believe in that. And I think that there's a lot of deeper lessons there that we could probably go on for hours is talking about how that relates to life. But you're the first uh, person I'm interviewing after the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Mm. Your album kind of has a lot in common with COVID-19. The initial making of it was filmed with, like, it was a crisis, right? There was that tragic yeah. loss of life. There's all this negative, negative yeah. lives, influences. You kind of self-quarantine yourself with your wife and you refocused and rebuilt it. How different in the DNA is this new album to what was left behind? Uh, it's almost like the, the old album, the old version of it. I mean, I'm, I'm, it's, not like I'll never, it's not like I'll never say never. You know, it's not like those songs can never come out. I mean, maybe someday they'll be relevant at some point. But it just seemed like there was an entire record that was about a certain thing that involved a group of people with a common cause. And then when that was no longer valid, I couldn't conscientiously stand there and sing the songs and I couldn't stand in front of a microphone and sing them. And I couldn't, I wasn't feeling it, you know? And I didn't feel like putting any more effort into something that was gonna benefit people who bailed. I was like, well, well, hold on a sec now. You, so, so after all that, you just, you're gonna up and leave. And now I'll continue to do the work and you'll collect half of the money 
for no longer doing anything. Well, that was not the that was not the point of starting on that endeavor. Is that we're all in this? You know, we we've always been creatively very generous with with people in the band. It's never been a democracy. We're not a bunch of dudes who grew up listening to rock and roll, playing rock and roll in dad's garage and, you know, then finally making it. So there, there's none of that. It's not a, uh, like I said, it's not a democracy where everybody has an equal say. I've always paid everybody and taken care of everybody, but in doing so, I've also always provided people with a forum for their creativity because I want people's contribution. I think it makes a richer experience for everyone as opposed to everyone just do what I tell you. Here's the parts, learn them. Here's the parts, learn them. How do you filter it through what you do? What, you know, so I've been a benevolent dictator in that way, I suppose. Oh, the CEO, the chief experience officer. Kind of. Yeah. So, um, so in, you know, staying open and involving people and making sure everyone's rewarded fairly for their contributions, that unfortunately, every once in a while comes back to bite you and that people then, you know, hold on to control of things. It's, it can be a nasty business and people feel entitled to, to things that, you know, without the knowledge of how much money actually gets sunk into a thing. Um, anyway, I don't want to go too far down that path, but you know, it's that old, the previous record, it just became more to do with things like that. I thought, man, this is not a, that record was supposed to be the rebirth and a, a new attitude and this positive move forward. And then it just became this horrible negotiation and lawyer lawyers and stuff like that i was like nah you know what you know what i can do i can make another record you can go pay your lawyer and you can fight about it all day i'm not i'm done you go ahead and do what you do i can just write more songs i can just write more that shows so a, we did. Uh, an abundance you know this uh this, this concept of uh abundance that there's but tons of creative ideas and you're better off to keep creating than holding on to as if you're all greedy for all these old ideas. So that's what you're doing. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, no, there's no, there's no love lost for, for old ideas. And even since making eternity now, um, you know, when, when Gary passed away, I was left with a very heavy heart, but also this great legacy of recorded, music from Gary that had never been released or been utilized. Just some great bass playing, some great rhythm tracks for songs that never became songs. So I took it upon myself to start resurrecting some of these things and in incorporating them into my creative world just to keep Gary's music alive. You know, so I keep I keep Gary with me every day in the in the studio. You know, I've got it. I've got his his basses back here. I've got his recorded, um, you know, a body of recorded works here. And Gary I feel like he can, still, he can still speak to me. You know what I mean? So Gary he's is a, a hard dude to that's lose, us. you know? So that's, that's led to an immense creative output. I have dozens and dozens and dozens of songs that I've reached out to, you know, our friends in, in the reggae genre and ask people to write songs on these rhythms, send me vocals, mix it. So I've got an entire catalog of, of reggae records that we're going to put out at some point as well. Wow. So, yeah, man, when you're open to it, even, even in the wake of tragedy, if you remain open, you and a lot of things can, can the, show up. The first single was uh, the better it gets. And it has mm -hmm. this really great seventies vibe to it. Uh, I can definitely feel that influence. I can't help I didn't know that. what to expect when I first started listening to it. And I, I have to say it wasn't love at first listen, but that's, that's a good thing for me. When what I were you expecting? I, I don't know. I, I haven't heard, for, I, I haven't been caught up. So there was a whole gap for me. And when I like something too quickly, I tend to leave it quickly. 
Mm-hmm. But if something grows on me, it stays for a long time. So right. I, re- I re-listened to it again this morning, and it's like, man, this is really growing on me. And uh, I could even picture, uh, was it the Bruce Dickinson saying, more cowbell. <laughs> out of all these things. But uh, it's really uh, this great, it's like um, going back in time, but making it so much more relevant uh, now, uh, just bringing back more simple times. I think this is what this whole experience of this pandemic is doing is, is making us uh, simplify our lives and, and seeing what is more important, you know. About- you made an interesting observation earlier. It, it really is like for us in this little compound here, this is kind of like the second time we're going through this, that self quarantining, letting the rest of the world do what it's doing. We have no idea what's happening beyond our gate here. You know, Um, we've been through this already. So this suits us quite well. I mean, I'm well equipped to survive the, the pandemic. It, it, it gives me a great, uh, it's a mental burden knowing that there are people out there who are suffering. That that is that is a massive difference. The uh, our previous quarantining was like, I don't care what's happening in the rest of the world. It's only what happens within our gates that that matters. Now we're fine here, but just knowing that there are. You know, a person has to have that empathy and sympathy and all of that, just and be mindful of what people are going through, especially healthcare workers. I mean, this is getting said over and over again. Hey, let's, you know, cheer on our our frontline healthcare workers. Man, we have no no idea what the. Yeah, I mean, that's they're like that's like the army, man. They're going to they're getting shot at. We don't we don't run run those risks the way they do you know, and, and, and people who, who do get sick and are suffering, man, that is nothing to, you know, I, I can't, I I just, I can't take the position of, of people who are holding up signs and protests saying, I need a haircut. Are you kidding me? Look at, you know, I need a haircut. I I cut my own. (laughs) I mean, I'll I'll, I'll go with this to say, you know what? I can take care of my own hair. Thanks. You know what I mean? It looks like this, but it's not. None of that is worth it. I mean, I'll deal with shortages at the grocery store. I'll learn to cook turnips. Like whatever. That's just these are very small problems compared to what what could be happening out there. I don't know. People saying like, "Oh, this is not as bad as as this disease. It's not as bad as that one. It's not as bad as like you. You don't want to see what that's like. Come on, man. Let's just." Not a gamble worth taking. Oof. The, yeah, it's it weighs heavily on me. That's that that is a big difference. Like I said, we're fine here. I got my studio up and running. I can create all day. I uh, do all the cooking. I'm happy to have my family around me all the time. But it's that extra mental weight of knowing that you know we're not we're not alone on this planet, man. There, there's people out there that are good people that that are getting hit. You know, so. So you you have this new album normally you'd be touring so it's, it's kind of like if you're uh prepared this there is that meal. i know you're a chef it's like you prepare this delicious meal and then your guests can't make it how do you feel about not being able to tour right now well how should one feel i mean there's nothing there's nothing i can do about it so i gotta kind of let it go i, I remember when it was only a couple of weeks ago now seems like eternity but it's only a few weeks ago where the shelter in place order first came down and i started getting panicked emails from everybody in my band and crew saying hey uh like i i know of all this is going down but i really need to know about those may dates i really need to know like you need to know <laughs> wow you do <laughs> just you <laughs> okay uh, i just you know i kind of just said to everybody Take whatever work you can get. I'm not going to hold you to it because I'm not leaving the yard. I'm not going. I'm not. I'm not going to go and do anything. I'm not going to play. We probably won't play the rest of this year. Just get used to that idea because why? Why fight it? It's. It's not what any of us would prefer. But who? 
we're not in charge of this, man. Like, just got to let it go. And, you know, I, I just hope all my my guys are, are okay and that people have some savings and that they've budgeted well and they're tucked in and, and able to able to weather the storm, you know. But there's nothing... I don't have any, anyway, it sounds like, it seems like rock star problems to me. It's like, oh, summer yeah. festivals are canceled. I mean, that's our income for the whole year. But uh, why, why, why mourn for concert season? You know what I mean? It's like, it'll come back. Just give it time, man. It'll come back. It'll be just as much fun when we do it. In fact, so just I let it go. Having this pause might make it even more special. As well, yeah. Hopefully, more. Maybe people won't be uh, behind their phones as much. Uh, uh, you know, actually living the moment because maybe you yeah. can watch a streaming concert now. You can be behind a phone and watch a concert, but it's not the same as being there live. Yeah. And and I know that creativity is not something you can contain. Uh, you yourself, you're very similar to a friend of mine whom you actually met once. Funny story. Might not might not talk about it, but. You, you met a, a friend of mine and he's also a very a great guitarist and he's, he's got like the perfect pitch. He can pick any, any instrument and just start playing. And he also became a, a chef like a, a, and he basically cooks. I find creativity, cool. you cannot keep it in. If it's not music, it's something else. And right. you, uh, what are you known for? What's your specialty when you're creating uh, this culinary masterpiece? Oh, my... You know, at first, my whole family was like, oh, my God, but what about going to this restaurant? What about this restaurant? What about, oh, my God, now we're not going to get to, you know, you, you, you take for granted how much we travel, my wife and I especially, how much we travel. And in every city, we have these great culinary experiences and we find the best coffee and on and on and on. And when that's out of the equation, that's when you realize, oh, man, we're, we we're quite used to that. So that, okay, well. There's no good, we're not going to get good Thai food here, so I'll experiment with that. And I got really good at that. Chinese. Okay, some different regional Chinese. Let's get into that. Italian's always been a specialty, but even there, I've had to delve into my recipe cachet, go a little deeper, because when it's seven nights a week, every week, you got to come up with some some moves, you know. <laughs> <laughs> like red sauce and noodles isn't going to cut it every night. So uh yeah, no man, I've I've gone uh I've gone pretty deeply into it. I was already pretty deep into it, but uh this has just given me a, a whole new whole new inspiration. And I've got a couple of pals, you know, the the guys in Widemouth Mason, we toured together for years and they remain really great friends. And that little trio of dudes it's almost on a daily basis as says there's really sexy dinner photos. <laughs> there's some iPhone 11 soft focus, beautifully staged <laughs> you know, dinner hits the table at my house and everyone's like, can we, can we eat yet? Or you, is the photo shoot done yet? <laughs> Are you done? <laughs> like, ooh, caramelized onions. Look at that. Could you just cook the food or are you going to take pictures of the food? So, there's that going on you brought your your wife uh out it's your wife right mm -hmm. alex uh, into the into the conversation yeah. uh by the way my my wife saw her at an interview this morning I, I guess uh we were watching an interview from a couple months back and and she uh -huh. wants to know what your wife's uh skin routine is because she says it's amazing <laughs> so her compliments to your wife's skin and just she says it's amazing. yeah amazing she's she's almost my age and I don't look as young as her. People are going to start accusing me of having a trophy wife. That's but all right. I've did, I did interviewed a couple couples that have, have collaborated together. Uh, the Royal Foundry. Uh, there was a, you know, Rain Meda and Chantal. Um, and, and there is a different dynamic when you're working with someone that's so close. Do you feel that you're able to, um, you know, have a compartmentalized um, relationship where like, okay, this is the music. And if you do something I'm not liking, I'm going to tell you where it won't affect the personal life? How's that working? Oh, that's that's a myth. There, <laughs> there's no way to separate church and state there. Yeah, well, I mean, she's honest enough with me that, yeah, no, she'll just have out with it and say, oh, yeah, no, what's, maybe you should 
do something different than I, I can be like, what are you, how dare you? What are you saying? It's your wife, you, you know, you gotta take it at face value. So there's definitely been more good than bad on, on, on that end though, in terms of, you know, if I can write something that makes her stop in her tracks and go, wow, it, it's gotta be really good. Cause she's been around from the, almost from the beginning, you know, she's heard, She's heard everything in its throughout the creative process. She's heard the beginnings of great things that and the stuff that has stood the test of time. Songs that are still relevant 20, 30 years later. She remembers what that creative process was like. So she can spot a winner, you know. She's seen it at your best, she's seen it at your worst. She's seen a lot of both. Mm -hmm. Love is Alive is was the second uh, single off the new album. Uh, is that related to anything personal? No, yeah, every song on there, it, we, even if there are cover songs, we we only play cover songs that have some that bear some connection to our experience. You know, uh, I'd always maintain that, and that was I think that comes from my love of blues music and and folk music and things like that you you really can only sell the stuff that you that you have a real connection to you know lyrically and that's a song that you know i remember from from being a kid i love that song when it came out when i was a kid on am radio we used to hear that every day man i love that that's just one of those tunes that i'd had in the back of my mind for the longest time thinking man big sugar would crush this this would be a that'd be a good one and it was always down in the back of my mind kind of like let it ride and dear mr fantasy there's just a couple of those songs like nobody covers these ones no one's digging these up let's let's just keep that one in mind and i happened to be in red deer alberta in a secondhand store looking at hats and scarves or something you know like oh used clothing that someone had kind of fancied up, you know? And this woman had a cassette player, like a cassette boom box, and she was playing Gary Wright out of a cassette, out of a cassette deck. And I was in the store and I thought, man, that sounds good. What, what are you listening to? I know this record, what record is this? And it was uh, Dreamweaver with Gary Wright. So she played the whole record. And while I was in the store, I heard that whole record go down. I thought, that's it, man. That's a sign. We got to We got to cut that one. And we went studio and cut that pretty, pretty soon after. And of course, you know, after we recorded it, I had friends from Colin James, Chris Robinson, just people calling me up and saying, Oh man, we were going to cover that. I'm like, were you, <laughs> were you late? Well, you didn't do it. That's awesome. Uh, so the album is is done now. If we want to, I I definitely have to get it on vinyl uh, to add to my collection. So the vinyl is is hot, man. It's this like fluorescent blue, beautiful. They match the the actual vinyl to the to the artwork. Yeah, man. No, it's it's hot. I saw it on Instagram. I saw uh, you and your wife uh, taking it out. I guess for the first time. So. Oh yeah. How can people get a hold of it? Because uh, you can't go to stores that much. Uh... No, it can be ordered. It definitely can be ordered online from Music Vaults. Uh, I don't have the. I'll get the link for, it and I'll put it up in the in the article. Yeah, Jennifer Knox at Universal can definitely get you get you that because it's already our pre sales are are really really good right now. Like we haven't even they don't even have stock of it yet i don't think and yeah the pre-orders are and that's one good thing is that people are now getting used to the idea if they were already used to shopping online now if you want band merch you gotta buy it online so cool well thank you so much i, I don't want to keep you too much longer